Hey YouTube, this is JD. I'm back with another game from the Isolated Queen Pawn. Again, we're following the uh, the uh, examples from Winning Pawn Structure Chess by Alexander Baburn. So uh, let's get into it. Uh, this game between Keen and Miles features a new move order for us to lead to uh, an Isolated Queen Pawn. Looks like we're starting out with some sort of a symmetrical English. But after knight c6 and then e3 here, uh, white's already signaling that he's in intending to play d4, which is going to lead us to probably something, some kind of a semi tarash And then here we have our pawn quad that uh, we've looked at a few times, which we know is quite possible that it's going to lead to an isolated queen pawn for one side or the other. So after C takes and then takes retakes with the knight, uh, Black is letting us know that he's not the one who intends to have the isolated queen pawn. So we get bishop d3, and after C takes d4, E takes, and uh, we have now arrived at uh, what is a pretty familiar position for us. Uh, we get bishop to e7, castles, castles, and then rook e1. Again, just uh, heading for a pretty typical, uh, pretty typical pretty typical development. And the, the queen can go to e2, the bishop can go to c, oh, excuse me, c4, maybe even c2 intending bishop d3, uh, which is probably going to provoke some sort of a weakness here on the king side. Um, <clears throat> here, uh, white, black played knight f6, um, but Baburin suggests that either bishop f6, which immediately adds some pressure here to d4, or even knight takes c3, uh, creating this pawn duo on c3 and d4 um, would have given better chances for black here. Instead, he just chose to go back to f6, oops, f6, which allows bishop g5, which again wouldn't have been possible when the knight wasn't there, of course. And then uh, knight b4. He's immediately going to try to blockade this uh, d5 square before there's any chance uh, that white could organize a, a d5 thrust himself. And I think white plays a really instructive move here. He plays bishop to b1. So he recognizes that going to c4 probably isn't going to yield him so much uh, because of the firm blockade that black has. He has the pawn, the two knights, yeah, bishop d7 and to c6, or even just b6 and uh, bishop c7, are, are, plus the queen. Um, even the queen could come to d6 at some point and put a rook behind it. Uh, d5 is not looking particularly possible at this point. So instead he puts the bishop back to b1. Of course he's not going to allow the bishop to be captured. Uh, this bishop tends to be an all-star in the uh, many queen, isolated queen pawns positions. Now the rook does get shut on, excuse me, does get shut in, uh, just showing how much white values this uh, light squared bishop that he's willing to shut his rook in in order to maintain it in an active position. So here we get uh, b6, just intending to bring the bishop up to further solidify d5. And then knight e5 from white, taking advantage of the fact that this knight has chose to reposition himself um, away from protecting the e5 square. Um, but already you can kind of see that uh, uh, white has the makings of a king side attack. He's got uh, two bishops, which are both uh, active on the king side. He's got this knight here and the rook on e1, and then the queen can pretty quickly jump over to the king side as well. Um, Baburn points out a, another interesting choice here. He says that white could have played a3 instead of knight e5. And this actually forces uh, black to um, play back to d5 with, a, with his knight. And sort of the, the thinking there is that from d5, uh, this knight is going to shield the d4 pawn. Uh, because if he tries to play something like back to, to knight c6, um, actually this is going to allow uh, white to get his uh, d5 break in immediately. Because after d5, if we see e takes d5, then we get queen c2, which is threatening to capture here and then mate, of course. So encouraging g6, uh, which weakens this knight here considerably. And after rook takes e7, <clears throat> already the knight can't take, because then we'll just take the, the bishop here. So he takes back with the queen, but then knight takes d5, is going to pick up this piece anyway. And uh, at the cost of a pawn and a rook, he's gotten two major p or sorry excuse me two minor pieces in return 
actually, yeah, two minor pieces in return. And uh, he's got these weak dark squares. He's either going to have a knight or a bishop posted here. And uh, this is probably going to be absolute lights out. Um, so <clears throat> instead of that, instead of playing a3, uh, white chose perhaps a more direct uh, play with knight e5. And then we get to bishop b7. And then here comes our thematic move from, uh, from the, the ideas that we're looking at in these games. We get rook e3. Just lifting this rook, it's going to come across to the king side and uh, is going to exert pressure either on g7 or h7 as the situation demands. <clears throat> Already, white has some pretty serious threats. So this isn't just a rook lift for the sake of a rook lift. If black plays carelessly, uh, we can already see a classic bishop sacrifice, albeit not the standard one we see, but if just something like rook c8, which looks like a normal, typical developing move, uh, white has this bishop takes h, oops, that's not true at all. <laughs> My move order backwards. First, he needs to capture here, removing that defender, and then he comes down to capture. And after queen, if after the, the king captures, we get queen h5 check, and then the king comes back and the rook comes across, and uh, only by playing bishop g4 captures, and then queen g4 captures, not g4, h4, can uh, black avoid mate. And uh, clearly this is a substantial loss in material. Um, so black can't play too carelessly here. And, uh, of course, Miles, uh, uh, good enough, strong enough of a player that he recognizes that threat and, uh, and plays g6 instead. Um, and then so another interesting move by White here. He chooses to play rook g3, which you would think, like, we have this sort of stronghold on g6, which is defended by two pawns here. Uh, but he already has a sacrifice in mind, which uh, we're going to see executed in this game. Notice that one, two, three pieces are all lined up against g6 already. So uh, white's already kind of hinting that, uh, that he's going to try something on that square. So now play, black plays the rook c8. Um, but again, just like in the Botvinnik game, um, this move turns out to be a pretty careless, a pretty careless move. Um, <clears throat> instead, Baburn suggests that he should play knight c6. And uh, with immediate pressure, uh, I guess we have to take back Black's move to play it. Knight c6 with immediate pressure on this knight on e5 and the pawn on d4. Which uh, this pressure, the threat of capturing here, is going to remove one of those defender, excuse me, remove one of those attackers from the, from the g6 square. But uh, that he didn't play that. Instead, he played the you know rook c8, which you know it's hard to fault him. It just doesn't meet the demands of this position. Uh, we get knight. Oh, excuse me. First, first. I keep getting ahead of myself in this game, trying to play my sacrifices and move too early. So bishop h6, which uh, on the on the surface just seems like it's going to clear the way for the rook for the sacrifice that we've been sort of hinting at all along. Um, but I think it does another key thing. It uh, kicks this bishop, or excuse me, kicks this rook over to d e8, which means that when the f pawn, after we get a sacrifice here with some captures, um, the rook isn't going to be able to lift itself to the uh, along the f file in order to help defend the king. It's uh, in in some regard been shut out from the king side. Uh, now, um, black, or excuse me, white plays another really key move. Um, he plays a3 here, which is important uh, because he's going to need control over the c2 square, believe it or not, um, in order to uh, effectively attack on the king side. And let's look at why. So if we assume that he goes for the sacrifice, so knight takes, and then takes here, and then he follows up with bishop takes, um, after pawn takes here, if he tries to play queen b1 to bring the king in, well then we're going to see a really nice move. We get knight e4, which is trying to block the, the queen's access, giving back one of the pieces, captures here, and then you get rook c2. Um, and now, uh, without the queen being able to connect with this g6 square, uh, black is going to be able to have time to organize a defense and white's just going to be down a piece without enough without enough play to, to justify uh, the piece that he's down. 
Um, <clears throat> so given that uh, he needs to kick this knight away from c2 so that rook c2 is not possible, um, that explains why he plays a3. <clears throat> Oops, I went back too far. So here, instead of the, the knight capture, he plays a3, which sends this knight along this way. And then now we get the sacrifice. Knight takes g6. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, pawn captures back, and now bishop takes g6. This kind of reminds me of the, the classic double bishop sacrifice. I think that was a last year game, right? Maybe you guys, uh, some one of you who knows can uh, leave me a comment and let me know. But I think it was a last year game where we saw the, the double bishop sacrifice. So f takes g6. And now you should take a moment and think about how you're going to continue this attack. Because there's a few moves that seem like they all accomplish the same thing, but in reality do not for some, some key fine points. Let's look at the alternatives. There are three ways that uh, white can get his, key, his queen onto this b1 h7 diagonal in order to join up with an attack on the, uh, on the g6 square. Uh, however, only one of them is going to work. Um, the worst one, or the most easy to refute, um, is just going to be to play, if he plays queen d3. The simple knight e5, taking advantage of this of the pin on the d-pawn, is going to make sure that he's able to defend it. Of course, white could take, but after queen takes queen and rook takes queen, um, he can just move this knight out of the way. And with the queens off the board, his attack probably isn't going to go anywhere. So queen d3 doesn't work. Queen c2... Um, also is not going to work for uh, a similar reason. Um, again, we see knight, <coughs> excuse me, we see knight to e5, which is going to defend the g6 square. And should we play uh, capture the knight, of course, then you get knight to e4, which takes advantage of this pin here uh, because the queen can't capture. Uh, nor the knight for that matter and so in this way he's gonna block the defense of the of the queen and uh, gonna be able to to hold this position it's still a bit tricky but he's doing considerably better than he was actually I think now I look at this I think maybe I have this backwards I think it's instead of playing knight e5 first I think it was knight hmm hold on maybe that was right I've got myself too many lines here Kind of getting them all mixed up and backwards. Queen c2. Let's see. I apologize, guys. Eh, maybe that was right. Maybe that was right. Okay. Anyway, so by process of elimination, we are we have arrived at instead of queen c2, we're going to play queen b1, which is going to avoid both of the pin on the c and the d file. So after queen b1, again, knight e5 is really the only way to try to, to maintain some sort of defense over this d6 pawn. But now, after just captures and then knight e4, we can just take it. And there's no rook c2 here as there was before. Um, <clears throat> here, um, black plays king h7. Um, this allows a checkmate, but there's really not anything better. Uh, for example, if he just takes... Um, then we're gonna just we're just gonna take it, and uh, again, there's just no way to add any additional protection to this uh, to this pawn. Um, even just p trying to advance the pawn so that the queen can't capture it doesn't matter because it's the square that's weak, not the pawn that's weak. So if we advance the pawn, we're just gonna get queen g g6, and mate's gonna follow very quickly. Uh, there's really not anything else that's gonna help. Uh, King h8. <clears throat> Honestly, after something like king h8, hoping to maybe bring the rook over to defend, there's really not a bad move that white can make. Uh, the, he almost, almost anything is still winning. I checked with an engine, and there are like at least 10 moves that white can make that are still uh, over a plus 5 advantage. So instead, he, uh, he played this king h7, and uh, after knight f6, which is threatening a mate here, uh, we get bishop takes, and then the queen comes in with his capture, comes back here, and then just this check takes, and we get a nice mate to finish. So uh, I thought it was also sort of interesting to note that despite the fact that uh, white invested two minor pieces in this attack, 
if somehow it weren't checkmate in this position, if there were an i8 that the king could go to, he could always just capture the bishop on b7. He's gained back both his pieces, and he has three additional pass pawns to, or excuse me, two pass pawns and one additional pawn to, to justify from his attack. So a really, really nice, really nice attack. If we want to go back, let's go back and take a look at uh, sort of the key moment in this game. So going back to when we played rook e3, if we look at this position. So I like to compare the, the ideas of what we've looked at in previous games and see if we can figure out why they don't work here. So <clears throat> the first idea we looked at was this f4, f5 plan, which... Um, in order for that to really be successful, our bishop needs to be on this line, and our rook probably needs to still be back here. Um, so we're not really coordinated for that plan. Um, for a sacrifice on the f7 square, again, our bishop would really probably need to be on this square, on this diagonal. Plus, uh, we have the additional problem that this knight can easily come here and blockade that. So again, that plan is not going to be successful at all. But some of the other factors that we do have in our favor is that this knight on b4 is going to be a touch misplaced and uh, unable to, to help with the attack. Um, it's a, kind of a little bit off sides. And we have our queen on this, or excuse me, not our queen, we have our bishop on this diagonal. And additionally, we don't have the, uh, enough pressure on e3 to stop us from having lifted this rook. So seeing these ideas, um, I think that that's what really justified and, and led White to the idea that he needed to be attacking on the king side instead of going for a d5 break or uh, an f4, f5 break or maybe a direct assault on f7. So after rook e3, we got this move to, to stop the immediate threats and then just brought his pieces to bear. Um, the, these two key preparatory moves, I mean, maybe bishop h6 is somewhat more obvious, but it, it wasn't immediately obvious to me why a3 was necessary. Uh, after the, the knight jumps back, we get this crazy looking sacrifice, and then another really key subtle point to making sure that uh, uh, white doesn't get victim to either one of these pins. And um, again, if black just forced to dump some material back, uh, but it's to no avail. He's uh, in the end, he's going to get uh, get a nice checkmating attack here, and a pretty fantastic game. Anyway, I hope that you guys uh, found this game instructive, just like I did. And uh, make sure to leave a comment, or maybe even like the video. And uh, make sure to continue following the series. I'll be keeping up with the. Uh, we're going to try to go through the entire book. So. Uh, Hope you guys enjoy it, and uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.